Hello, my name's David Standing, and in this short lecture, I'm going to be talking about the process of discovering the layout of Gilbert White's garden uh, at the Wake Selborne. I've been, I was gardener there for uh, some many years, and I'm intrigued by the layout of Gilbert White's garden and its many intricacies. If we go back to the 18th century, uh, Gilbert White's Selborne was looking physically very similar to the Selborne we see today. Maybe there's a few more houses, but in general, uh, as you can see from this front piece of the first edition of the Natural History, um, the book which made him so uh, famous uh, for so many years. And in this picture, you can see the beach clad hangar. The street of Selborne is in the middle of the picture. And uh, in the foreground is church meadow and a Turkish tent. To the middle left is the zigzag. And all of these features, I think Gilbert regarded uh, as part of his landscape garden. So he didn't just build the garden behind his house, which incidentally is dead center of the picture. He didn't just uh, make that garden, but he seemed to include the whole of Selborne as part of his garden, because it was the time of the English landscape garden. And indeed, the hangar is still there, of course, with all its beauty and much admired by Gilbert White and uh, many people since. The changing colours of the beech trees and the lights and shades were admired by Gilbert White and still form a magnificent backdrop to the garden today. But when I arrived there in 1979, uh, there were many different things there and many things that are there now which have since gone. As you can see from this plan, the Wakes is actually next to the road at the top of the picture, there was a long strip of uh, woodland and shrubs with bulbs over the uh, crest of Baker's Hill, the small hill to the south of the building. The intensive horticulture was going on uh, to the north where you can see little flower beds outlined. This was even more intensive in the 1930s, where you can see in this aerial view pictures of the rose garden and the rock and water gardens, which required five full time gardeners to keep them up to scratch. When I came to the museum in 1979, there were uh, some new features added. They were trying to simplify the garden because all they could afford was one man two days a week. And uh, so a lot of features had to be changed. One of the features made was a laburnum arch. Another was a, a garden of old shrub roses, which was later criticized because it had many Victorian cultivars rather than Georgian ones that Gilbert White's Georgian character was more appropriate to have Georgian. Uh, although it was uh, not a lot of attention was paid to period gardening at that time. There was also a very intensive herb garden at the very north of the property, which was a nightmare to keep under control. And uh, if it had just been a, a job two days a week without anything else, I doubt whether I would have stayed there. But there were lots of interesting documents surrounding Gilbert White's garden, which perhaps makes it one of the best documented gardens of its type in the 18th century. There is um, his garden calendar, which was his garden diary, which he kept for some 20 years. And this was followed by his naturalist journal, which although containing an increasing amount of natural history information, was uh, also containing a great deal of garden information. So between the two of them, there were over 40 years of information about the garden. And one of the first things I did, having a geographical background, was to try and work out the different locations within the garden. So I made a list of well over 30 locations and listed everything that went on in these locations. The uh, screen you see now is the details for the necessary house, which was in fact, of course, the outside toilet. Uh, but in fact, there are, I say, over 30 locations which I've detailed the plants and the location of as far as possible from the diary entries. 
these locations actually changed over time as well. So uh, from 1751 right up to the 1780s, it's possible to trace the number of mentions of each individual part to give you an idea of how the garden developed. For example, the little garden, location two, soon disappeared in 1754 and it was absorbed into other gardens. So when I looked at the garden in 1979, there was only a few items that were recognisable as out of Gilbert White's. There was the fruit wall um, and there was uh, some archaeology we did which indicated that the fruit wall was a lot longer than it was today. There was the sundial, there was the ha-ha, uh, and a winding brick path, interesting curve in the path could be significant, as well as of course the area of land known as Baker's Hill, where a lot of his gardening uh, developments seemed to take place. As a result of all this, I was able to compile a short guide called the Wakes Garden, but I was still really hunting for details of where these actual locations were. And by a bit of luck, I happened to pick up a copy of Gilbert White's Year uh, with an introduction by Richard Maybe, and produced in 79, it uh, showed me that the garden had actually been illustrated by Samuel Grimm, the same picture uh, in the front piece of the Natural History of Selborne uh, that was the artist that originally made it. And there are two interesting views of the Selborne garden, which uh, were incredibly useful in trying to detect where the various areas of the garden were although a little care is needed because the church you see on the left um, certainly isn't in that position today and we do know that it won't have moved. So there's a little bit of artistic license. And there it is again, two quite detailed pictures of the garden. So up to that point, I'd used illustrations from Grimm and others uh, and his diaries and we're just getting into the letters and account books to try and build up a picture of Gilbert White's garden. The archaeological evidence and the maps and surveys were to be studied later. Turning the original plan round a bit, because when I was actually living at the Wakes, I always viewed the garden as kind of spreading out from one point, which was the main street. And looking towards the hangar, this is the layout which we saw earlier. And if you then compare it with an early plan of mine drawn on the same trajectory, you can see that I was actually struggling with where the field boundaries were and where the various features in the garden were and we got a lot further with that today but that was an important first step. You might recall in 1987 we had a bit of a wind, in fact it was a hurricane and it blew trees down which was bad news but not too much damage in the garden of uh, Gilbert White uh, but uh, it was actually good news from the point of view that grants were available for the reconstruction of gardens and so the trustees straight away uh, decided that they were going to uh, try to reconstruct the garden. The Kim Wilkie report seen here at the bottom of the page was by far the most useful and uh, was used to make a major reconstruction in 1995 of, of the garden. And this was the plan Basically, it extended Baker's Hill so we could accommodate all the activities that we know Gilbert White was carrying out on that uh, part of the garden and added a lot of sight lines to eye catchers. So it was actually a landscape garden with eye catchers across this uh, 20 acre park. This is perhaps a more understandable picture of it, which I had drawn by one of my volunteers at the time, which gives you an idea of what's where much more than the plan does. And uh, the, the plan consisted of a number of sector gardens. You can see the quincunx, the arrangement, domino five arrangement of trees at the top of the hill, and an area of the garden called the field with circular flower beds in. This was one of many areas which we located in this plan. 
there was also, of course, the revolving wine pipe seat, a revolving barrel you could sit in and look at the various landscape views. And also uh, urns, oil jar vases, which are sort of cut price stone urns that Gilbert White erected on his landscape garden with a budget. The pedestal was set on a small mount and uh, the, the pedestal itself was made of wood to save money. The Gilbert White also had a alcove made to look like a Greek temple and uh, probably made a little bit shorter than it actually was in, in uh, real life, but certainly an interesting feature facing west into the setting sun. But perhaps the most stunning feature was Hercules, which wasn't a three-dimensional statue at all. It was a picture of Hercules painted on a board and erected some 12 feet high, which uh, was reproduced in the garden to the amusement of many visitors. It was to be viewed through six field gates in perspective, a most unusual part of the garden, and this was cleverly devised uh, across the fields of Baker's Hill in the Kim Wilkie plan. However, after a while, I began to realize that it didn't quite fit the actual data because although Hercules was viewed from the second gate, when you looked at it from the first gate, it wasn't at all visible and many of the gates were not visible either. So I, I began to think it didn't really fit exactly the plan as were the position of some of the fields mentioned by Gilbert White. But nevertheless, a very good uh, representation of the Gilbert White garden on the information we had. In fact, the whole Wilkie plan very cleverly left a 20 acre field, which was good for uh, wildlife and, and uh, holding events at the uh, bottom of the picture here. And the intensive gardens were up much nearer to the house, making a very neat and uh, compact reconstruction with detailed gardens to the north of the property as before and a wildlife garden. The, the detailed gardens this time having period plants. The problem I had was that many of the fields mentioned by Gilbert White could not be precisely located, uh, especially as I said the Yule Close. Um, but we do know that he bought fields behind his house and that there must have been a number of them. So going to the time for Selborne, which was 1842, I was hoping to find some field boundaries, but alas, I was disappointed and found that once again, the 20 acre plant park again existed uh, and there were no subdivided fields, although quite a few more smaller fields to the left or the northwest of the property. So uh, that drew something of a blank. However, uh, another uh, interesting development was to look out from another uh, vantage point where Samuel Grimm had painted uh, a picture of Selborne. And this was in the, from the New Hermitage where it shows the quincunx in the middle of, of a field, uh, which wasn't at all obvious from the start. We thought perhaps it might have been the mount with the barrel on it, but uh, when the house was covered with plastic uh, in 2002-03 for restoration purposes, I was able to go up to this site and see exactly where the orientation of the picture was. This meant uh, the ridges in the field had an increased significance and um, I began to think that the, possibly the, the small two or three feet high changes in level across the 20 acre field might have been old field boundaries. And in fact, although they'd never been precisely mapped, uh, very difficult to photograph and, uh, uh, and even more difficult to map, you can see in this uh, satellite picture, if you look very carefully, little black lines across the wakes field in the middle of the picture. Not the white line, which is a footpath through the long grass, but the little black lines, which seem to be those actual ridges in the field. If you combine this information with information from the title deeds of the wakes, which uh, uh, often said, this field, now part of the park, which gave you an indication there were other fields in the park, 
with uh, copyhold information, the survey of 1793 and one of 1678, you uh, begin to come to an understanding that there were separate fields. Even the 1870 OS map, 25 inches to the mile, shows trees in the parkland precisely where they were. And these, once again, seem to align with those black lines on, on the map on the on the satellite picture rather so i was able then to draw up a tentative picture of where the separate fields were so this was a very exciting development and leads one to believe that the gilbert white garden was a sort of ornamental farm design where you looked out across cultivated fields and uh, so i was then beginning to use many of the sources of information that uh, had become available as well as the illustrations and the diaries the copyhold records the title deeds the letters account books some archaeological evidence and some old maps and surveys became very useful in trying to fathom out what was where. Now, this is by no means a sort of final um, diagram of where the fields are. It's just an attempt to work out where some of them may have been. So a sort of rectangular layout, which may have looked something like this, but uh, rather too stylized. So in all this work over 30 years, uh, I've had great fun and been helped by a lot of people. So I just like to thank those people that have helped me and uh, hope that you have found it as interesting as I have.